Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. He won 207 games, went 29-9 and in 1944, and followed that by going 25-9 and in 1945. Both seasons, he was named the American League's MVP, and to this day is still the only pitcher in baseball history to win back-to-back -back MVP awards. Yet, when it came to the Hall of Fame, voters came up with every excuse imaginable to deny him enshrinement. However, they just couldn't keep him out. Next on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to take a look back on the Hall of Fame career of one of the greatest pitchers in the history of the Detroit Tigers, Hal Newhouse. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you can tune in for another great podcast. Joining me in just a little bit will be David M. Jordan, author of A Tiger in His Time, a terrific read about the career of Hal Newhouser. But Jordan did a lot more than write about Hal. He was a key force behind the campaign to get Newhouser enshrined into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and it worked. In fact, Newhouser was so thankful, he sent Jordan a handwritten note thanking him for his efforts. And if you want to see and read that note, please visit the Sports Forgotten Heroes website, sportsfh.com. In fact, to find out more about Hal and David, and to check out past episodes, guests, and to see who will be featured coming up on the podcast, please visit sportsfh.com. To see how you can participate in a future episode, or to show your support, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash sportsfh. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash sportsfh. Follow us on Twitter at Sports F Heroes or look for the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook. And as always, thank you to Henry R. and Jack K. for your continued support. Back to Hal. His best years came during World War II, and the knock against him was during his best years, baseball's best talent was overseas fighting. Hal, however, was 4F because of a heart murmur and despite wanting to fight, was prohibited from doing so. But there were other guys who pitched during the same time period who did not face the same scrutiny as Hal, most notably Bob Feller. Now, Feller enjoyed a longer career than Hal, won more games, and struck out more batters. But Newhouser did what he was supposed to do during the war years, and he still won 26 games in 1946 after the war was over and another 21 in 1948. He won 18 more in 1949. However, arm troubles plagued him and affected his career totals. But when he was at his best, he dominated. Joining me now on Sports Forgotten Heroes is David M. Jordan, the author of many terrific books. You might say an eclectic collection of books from FDR, Dewey, and the election of 1944 to Winfield Scott Hancock, A Soldier's Life, to A Tiger in His Time, which is the story of Hal Newhouser. David, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. I'm glad to be here, Warren. So let me ask you this. Why Hal Newhouser? Why a book about Hal? The very first major league game I ever saw, my father took me to Shibe Park on Memorial Day in 1943 when I was eight years old. And it was a doubleheader between the Tigers of Detroit and the Philadelphia A's. And in the first game, 
Hal Newhauser pitched for Detroit, and he pitched a two-hit shutout. And uh, the second game, the A's won, and I became an A's fan from then on. But I was always a Hal Newhauser fan after that. And uh, you know, <clears throat> several weeks later in the same season, uh, the All-Star game was played in Shy Park in Philadelphia. And it was the first night All-Star game. But uh, my father took me to that, too. And once again, Hal Newhouser pitched for the American League in that All-Star game. So you had, so, a, uh, so you had a pretty uh, early indoctrination to Hal Newhouser. Right, yes. And I saw him pitch quite a few times over the course of his career. Uh, I went to a lot of games that the A's played in Philadelphia. And uh, whenever the Tigers came to town, if Hal was pitching, I would try to get down to that game. Isn't it amazing how we can remember such great details from early on in our life, especially when it comes to baseball? I remember my first ever game with my dad. I grew up in New York. I was a Mets fan, and in 1970, we saw the Mets play the Astros. I saw Nolan Ryan pitch for the Mets and Larry Durker pitch for the Astros. (laughs) So you actually played a uh, pivotal role in getting Hal elected to the Hall of Fame. What was that like? And tell me about the letter he sent you upon his election and, and why the campaign to get Hal elected. Well, because he had been a a great favorite of mine, I was always, you know, startled when the Hall of Fame voting came out and he was finished, you know, about halfway down the list and he never got elected by the writers. And I thought, you know, Hal Newhouser was a great pitcher. Why isn't he in the Hall of Fame? So I decided to uh, write a book about him. And part of the reason for the book is arguing for the fact that he should be in the Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, I got into a lot of research about that, uh, a lot of books that came out and statistical evidence that uh, really placed him very high among left-handed pitchers and among all-time pitchers. And, uh, you know, I decided I would put all this in my book if I could. Uh, I also had a chance to go out to uh, suburban Detroit and visit with Hal, and uh, he was quite hospitable. We sat in his living room, and I (laughs) interviewed him and talked until I ran out of the reels on the recording machine. (laughs) And it was after that stopped that I asked him if, you know, why, how he felt about the Hall of Fame. And he said, well, I'm not bitter about that. (laughs) But then when he went on after that, it was clear that he was greatly disappointed by the fact that he had been overlooked by the writers and not put in with the, uh, the great pitchers that he considered himself to be worthy of. When the book came out, uh, and of course he was one of the first to get a copy of it, He got in touch with my publisher and said, I will sign Dave Jordan's book at the two biggest suburban Detroit bookstores, autograph sessions, if you will send a copy of his book to every member of the Veterans Committee for the Hall of Fame. Wow. So that that took place. And the next time the Veterans Committee met in early 1992, they voted him in. Incredible. So he, uh, he considered very much that I had a good bit to do with his getting in. And I told him, how no, it was your record that got you in. I just happened to argue about it and got some convincing arguments across. Yeah, but, you made uh, some great points in that book, no doubt about it. Well, I felt that it was, uh, it was for real that... He, that he really was one of the top pitchers. Now, in, in the wartime years, once he learned to control his his control and his temper, which basically happened when Paul Richards came up as his, the catcher in the Tigers uh, organization, and Paul Richards, who was a veteran, 
I was able to calm him down and show him how to go about doing things the right way. Uh, that led to his great work in 44 and 45, and, uh, and which are considered, of course, the war years. But, you know, he was way above what anybody else could have done in the war years. Sure. And, uh, yeah, he put together... 19- yeah, he put together three incredible years. In 44, he went 29 and 9. In 45, he was 25 and 9. In 46, he went 26 and 9. Not too many pitchers have ever gone through a stretch like that. But the three years afterwards, after what was considered to be wartime baseball, he still put up some great numbers, winning 17 games, 21 games, then 18 games. And he oh, yeah. could probably he, won more. Tell me about that six-year stretch and just how dominant a pitcher Hal Newhouser was. Well, he, uh, he, you know, he also won the earned run average uh, award uh, title in '45 and in '46. And of course, in 1946, all the veterans were back from the war. Right. And, uh, they said this was this would be when Newhouser got put down again. But he was just as good after winning the MVP awards in 44 and 45. In 1946, he finished second in the MVP voting behind Ted Williams. The case Jordan built for Newhouser was a strong one. In his book, Jordan noted that Hall of Fame pitcher Ted Lyons, who pitched from 1923 to 1946, won 260 games during his career and lost 230, and would later become a manager and a pitching coach, said that Newhouser deserved to be elected. The book, the All-Stars All-Star Baseball Book, was also quite revealing. Of the players who played with or against Newhouser, 13 said he would be their number one left-handed pitcher. No other lefty received more than three votes. In a book called The Player's Choice, in which 645 players responded, Newhouser was rated eighth. Four times he led the American League in wins. Twice he led an ERA. Twice in complete games and twice in strikeouts. He is the last pitcher in the American League to have three straight seasons of at least 25 wins, having won 29 in 1944, 25 in 1945, and 26 in 1946. He is one of very few pitchers to have led the league in winning percentage, ERA, and strikeouts in the same year. Of the 74 pitchers currently in the Hall of Fame, Newhouser is 55th in wins, 40th in ERA, and 44th in strikeouts. When Jordan's book was published in 1990, the book Total Baseball ranked every pitcher to have played the game. Newhouser was ranked number 15 all time. Who were some of the hitters he faced during the war years, and how did he fare against them? There were a lot of players who were in the service, but there were a lot of very good players who were still not in the service. You know, uh, Dizzy Trout, Ernie Bonham of the Yankees, uh, Lou Boudreau, Bobby Doerr. You know, Mel Ott was still around. Stan Musial was around for all but the 45 season. And uh, so the, the war years were not all that bad. And there were players who came up from the minors to take the places of some of the drafted players who were, you know, they were good professional ball players. They may not have been as good as the ones who went off to the war, but they were professionals and they were able to play the game. And so the, the game still, you know, was pretty well played in the, during the war years. The three years in which Newhouser really dominated, 1944, 45, and 46, Hall of Famer Lou Boudreau hit 310. Bobby Doerr, also a Hall of Famer who missed the 1945 season because of the war, hit 294. Ted Williams missed 44 and 45, came back in 1946 and hit 342 with 38 home runs and 123 RBI. Joe DiMaggio hit 290 in 1946 with 25 home runs and 95 ribbies. 
Baseball was back at full strength in 1946, and Newhouser was as tough as nails against the very best baseball had to offer, going 26-9 with a league-leading 1.94 ERA. He threw 29 complete games, struck out a career-best 275, and tossed six shutouts. Oh, after having won the MVP award in 1944 and 1945, as Jordan mentioned, he finished second to Williams in 1946. Sure, during 1944 and 1945, baseball was missing a lot of its stars, but Newhouser proved after they had all come back, he could still get them all out. And by the way, how wanted to serve, but couldn't. He had some kind of a heart murmur. I mean, he volunteered to the draft board, uh, I think, two or three different times. And each time he was turned down by the medics because of this heart murmur that he had, which didn't appear to affect his pitching, but it did affect what the Army had in in mind. So that's why he was able to stay in in the... major leagues during the war. How did that affect him, or how do you think that affected him mentally? How disappointed was he that he couldn't go and fight for his country? Well, he felt that he, you know, he had wanted to do his best for the country, and he had tried to do his best. You know, he was disappointed, but he was said, okay, that's the way it's going to be. I'll go back and I'll, I'll pitch. And uh, he, he did that very well. He sure did. He was discovered by a gentleman by the name of Wish Egan. Tell me about Wish and how he found Hal Newhouser. Well, Wish Egan was, uh, had been the, uh, the top scout for the Tigers for a long time. He, he was quite, uh, quite old at the time, but he, he found Newhouser, uh, when he was pitching high school ball. And uh, and he pitched in the American Legion ball, and uh, so Wishigan followed him for a couple of years, and he had uh, he had Harold work out at Briggs Stadium, the Tigers' ballpark, several times, and he, he told him some things to do. He, he told him about improving his grip for throwing his curveball, and. Uh, <laughs> I guess Hal didn't realize it, but there was a Cleveland scout who also was watching him on right. several occasions. And uh, as soon as the, uh, <laughs> I guess the, because of the American Legion restrictions, or they had to wait for a period of time till that season was over. And as soon as he was eligible, uh, Wish Egan came around to uh, to the house, and. Uh, <laughs> He he came down and, and went into the dining room with the family, and he put down four hundred dollar bills. And of course, this was you know just was coming out of the depression. Then. Yeah, and the hundred dollar bills looked great. So the uh, the family Anna wanted to sign him, and also was going to sign him for one hundred and fifty dollars a month salary playing baseball, and. Uh, also, Del Baker, who was the manager of the Tigers, was with him, and he said, "And here's your manager, Del Baker, and he'll be on the floor with you." So at that point, Hal's parents and Hal signed the contract. He was still a minor at that point, right? And just just after Egan and Baker left the house, uh. A big Lincoln Continental car turned the corner and came down the street and parked in front of their house. And uh, this know, is an people, unbelievable story, David. <laughs> people in that neighborhood were not used to seeing these big cars, but out of the car got Bill Bradley, who was the Cleveland scout who had been scouting him, and Cy Slapnica, who was the general manager of the Indians, and <laughs> Bradley introduced them to Hal and his parents to to Cy Slapnica and he said well Hal we're here to sign you to a contract with Cleveland and he said here's fifteen thousand dollars and here's a keys to a car for your dad (laughs) and Hal then said you know I'm sorry but I just signed with Detroit 
And uh, at that point, there was some recriminations from Hal's mother who said, you know, you never showed us any interest. And uh, so that turned out to be uh, kind of a, a big story and a big disappointment all at one time. Was it? Did, was there but, any animosity? Did Did Hal feel any animosity towards Wish and the Tigers that they might have lowballed him? Was there anything like that? I don't think there was. He uh, He knew he was going to pitch for Detroit. It was his hometown, and uh, of course, his mother did call Wish Egan and told her about the fifteen thousand dollars, and said, "You hoodwinked my young son." <laughs> and uh, Hal, Hal said, he said, gee, Ma, don't do that because I'm in their hands now. They can tell me what to do, and it may hurt my career. Right. And, uh, and Egan <clears throat> assured Mrs. Newhauser that if Harold made the big leagues, they would take good care of him. And they did. <laughs> and they did. Right. You're right. You know, yeah. he, he advanced quickly, and ultimately he pitched – for the Tigers while he was still in high school. Now, I know the story of Joe Nuxhall. How unusual was it for someone still in high school to play in the majors, and how do you think that affected his career? Well, it you know, <laughs> it started him off slowly. You know, he pitched for Beaumont in the Texas League in 1939 when he was 18 years old, and he he impressed everybody with his pitching, but he lost a lot of games down there. But then he did come up and pitched one game at the end of the season, starting it for Detroit, his first major league game when he was 18 years old. Incredible. And, uh, and in 1940, he was with the Tigers all season long. They, you know, they thought they were going to send him back to the minors, but they decided that he looked like he could work in the majors, and so they kept him up there. And he won nine games and lost nine games for them in 1940, uh, which was a year they won the pennant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he he still had control problems. He walked a lot of batters. And he had a, you know, a temperament. He used to, uh, you know, he'd turn around and glare at an infielder if he kicked the ball or made an error or something. And, uh, you know, the, the Tiger players who played with him in those early years were not wild about talking about him afterwards. Mm -hmm. But uh, then when, when Paul Richards came up and uh, it really got him straightened out, he, he, he managed to calm Hal's temperament down and he got him straightened out on his pitching and his control problems. And Hal became basically a great pitcher at that point. Right. So it was Paul Richards that really turned Hal's career around into making him a great pitcher. So as you alluded to, one of the things that struck me about his career was his wildness, especially early on. He walked a lot of batters. In fact, over the course of his first 10 seasons, he averaged almost 107 walks a year. But what I found even odder was the fact that the Tigers basically didn't coach him until Richards came along. They let him train on his own and to try to work out his difficulties on his own. Why was that? And how much better might his career have been had he received coaching early on? Jack Zeller, the Detroit general manager, apparently sent the word out to the uh, the managers, uh, the coaches, both in the minor leagues and in the spring training, to, you know, leave Newhouser alone. Don't get into constru instructive work for him. You know, let him figure out on his own how to pitch. What was the turning point? Was it Paul Richards? Was it the fact that Detroit was using him inconsistently and they finally agreed to put him into the rotation in a more regular manner, pitching every fourth or fifth day? Well, they, uh, you know, they, they, they did get him into a more regular routine, but, you know, he started, 
you know, 20 games for them in 1940 when he was 19 years old and 27 the next year and 23 and 42, 25 in 1943. And he but, was, but, wasn't that, but wasn't that inconsistent? Wasn't it like, well, you're, you're going to pitch today and we'll have you start again six days from now and then 10 days from now and then four days from now? It wasn't like a, a regular routine or was that the way it was in baseball back then? I guess it was probably a little less straight than it is now. But they also used him as a relief pitcher right, frequently. Right, right. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in 1942, when he started 23 games, he pitched in a total of 38. So that was, you know, another 15 games that he pitched in relief. And uh, But even, you know, out of the 23 games he started, he completed 14 of them. You don't see that today. No, I'm sorry. He completed eleven of them. Yeah, you don't see the, you don't see eleven complete games today. Right. Yeah. Well, in 1945, he completed 29. That's incredible. In 1946, That's... with all the guys back from the service, he completed 29, and he led the league in earned run average. There are guys who pitch for 15 years today that don't complete 29 games over the course of their career. What pitchers, <laughs> right. what, what pitchers did back then is just amazing. 1944, he finally puts it all together and goes 29-9. and nine. What was different for him, and how crucial was it for Hal to have such a great season in 1944? Well, it, it, it made him clearly the best pitcher in the in baseball at that time or the best pitcher in the major leagues and um, yeah in 1943 he got started the first half of that season he was pitching almost the same way as he did in 44 and then uh, something went wrong and he had I think he may have had some arm aches or something Mm -hmm. and the second half of the 43 season was not very good but in 44, he was ready to go, and he <laughs> he just did everything right. And in 45, he did the same. You know, he had a 1.81 earned run average. And in 46, he did the same. And he, he did all sorts of good work from there on. In 47, he had a off year of 17 wins and 17 losses. But his earned run average is still 2.87 at that point. And uh, and he led the league in complete games. Then in 48, he won 21 again, including s- several key games against Cleveland and Bob Feller, right. even though the Indians won the, the pennant that year. Let's go back for a second to 45. He helped Detroit win a World Series. Obviously, that's the goal of every, you know, for everybody. How big right. was the 45 season for he and Detroit? Well, it was it was great for him. I mean, he was twenty five and nine in the MVP, led the league at earned run average, and uh, twenty nine complete games led the league, and he had eight shutouts. But uh, but there were writers and and people who said, well, he's only doing this because he's a good pitcher. He's not a great pitcher, and the talent he's facing is inferior because the best talent is overseas fighting the war. How unfair well, 40, is that? In 45, that wasn't actually true because during the course of the season, a lot of the veterans were coming back in the latter part of the season. So some of these wartime absentees were actually back in 45 for the second half of the season when he kept winning and he kept winning games that they had to win because they didn't win the pennant until the last day of the season. And then uh, the the World Series for him was a little strange. In the opening game of the series, he got knocked around badly, and the Cubs won. But later on in the, I think it was the fourth game, he pulled himself together and won. And then in the, the final game, um, he he was fortunate that his Tigers went out and scored a number of runs before he even had to pitch so that he won the final game of the World Series. So he had two wins and one loss in that series, and uh, he was the dominant player. 
And it was against, as you said, players that were coming back from from the war, and yet still, writers or the voters said, well, it's still against inferior talent, and your book proved them wrong. You know, another thing that struck me about Hal's career was the fact that he was, I guess, snake-bitten. And by that I mean, from what I read, there was a lot of poor defensive play behind him. Were the Tigers a poor defensive team at that time, or was it just when Hal pitched? You know, some players or <laughs> pitchers are, are snake-bitten. You know, they don't get run support. It seemed to me like Hal was always fighting against or or was the victim of poor defensive play, and he could have won a lot more. Yeah, they did. Uh, they did lose some games for him with their sloppy play in the field, and uh, I can't say whether the Tigers were worse in that respect than other teams, but I know they uh, <laughs> they did give Hal some trouble that way. You know, one thing I, I do want to mention about Hal before you know it gets away from his pitching actually, but after he got out of baseball, he had a lengthy career working for a bank in Detroit. Right. And then he got back into scouting and he, uh, well, he scouted for Baltimore for a while. Then he was scouting for Houston. (laughs) Al Rosen was the uh, president of the Houston ball club. And he and Hal had gotten to know each other when, during the playing days. And in 19, uh, I think it was 1990 or 1991. 1992. Houston, it was 1992. I know where you're going with this. Okay. Yeah. Houston Astros had the number one draft pick in the draft. And Hal's specialty, uh, he, he, he didn't want to travel all over the country. So his area for scouting was the you know southern Michigan area. <laughs> and... He told the Houston front office that there was this kid up in his area that they ought to use for the uh, use their first draft pick on the number one pick was, in the draft. He was the, the first number one draft of of everybody, and he was a a shortstop by the name of Derek Jeter. <laughs> and the Astros selected Phil Nevin, not a bad ball and player. The Astros yeah. selected Phil Nevin, so. right. And, and, and he's not a bad ball player, but he's not Derek Jeter. No, Derek Jeter's going to wind up in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Hal was so disgusted with Houston not taking his word for that. I mean, he, he went out of his way to say that this is a great-looking kid and he really got to use him. So he, he quit his scouting career at that point. He told Houston to go on their way, and he was gone. Yeah, and it's not like Hal had a bad eye. I mean, early early on during his uh, days as a scout for the Orioles, he found Dean Chance. He found Milt Pappas. Pappas and Jack Fisher. He had a heck of an eye for talent. Yeah, he was a good scout. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, let's let's just go back. Earlier you had talked about the fact that Hal pitched a ton in relief throughout his career even during the years when he was winning 20-plus games a season. Was this typical of all starting pitchers, or was it just the way Detroit decided to use Hal Neuhauser? I think they – I don't know. It may have been more typical, Uh, certainly more typical than today when starting pitchers never pitch relief. Right. But uh, I – Looking back on it, I was surprised to see how often they were using him in relief. But, and, and, uh, and this is in between starts where he could pitch, throw 120, 130, 150 pitches. He could pitch 10, 11, 12 innings. And then a day or two later, they're throwing him out there for another three or four innings in relief. It was crazy. Yeah, well. He wound up with 26 saves in his career. All, the, 
all, all those innings, all those pitches had to really start to add up. And Hal experienced a lot of pain in his arm. 49 and 50 is when it really came to the fore. And in 51 and 52, he really struggled. What were his final years like with Detroit? Well, he was he he, he had shoulder problems and arm problems, and he was uh, you know he kept he told the the team and he told the manager in the front office about the problems, and he said he would you know like to rest a little bit more so that he could come back and pitch at full strength, and sometimes he was able to, but a lot of times the the arm troubles just didn't go away. And that's why, you know, his major league career was really over at the age of 32, which was unfortunate, but it was because of the arm problems in the shoulder. And he still won And they over never figured out what yeah. it was. And they never figured and, out what uh, it was. Uh-huh. You know, if, with today's medical research and abilities, they probably could have decided what he was to do. But they weren't able to do that in the uh, early 50s. And so he still won he over was, 200 games. He won 207 games, even in, you know after the Tigers let him go. And he signed with Cleveland to pitch for 54. Um, and basically, he pitched in, uh, in relief. He started one game for them, but he was out in the bullpen helping... Um, Ray Narleski and the you know the other young Cleveland relief pitchers <laughs> figure out what they were doing, and he also won seven games for Cleveland in '54, pitching in relief, as well as getting seven saves, and uh, and then they asked him the Indians asked him to come back at the beginning of the '55 season, even though he he told them he really thought he was done. But, you know, his buddy, Hank Greenberg, whom he can good friends with on the Tigers, was Cleveland's general manager at that point. So he asked Newhauser to come back because Cleveland had a young left-handed pitcher they were bringing up. They hoped for great things from, and they were hoping that Hal could spend some time with him and give him some pointers on how, how to pitch in the major leagues. And so he came back and did that. He spent the spring training in Cleveland or with Cleveland, uh, and working with this young pitcher named Herb Score. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, he pitched a couple games, and then he hung it up, and that was the end of his major league career. But he was happy to see how Herb Score developed over the years, too. How did Hal compare to other left-handed pitchers of the same time? I would say he was <laughs> just about the best of them. Um you know, they were, uh, there have been some books and all written. Didn't Ted by, Williams, uh, did, didn't Ted Williams think that Hal Newhauser was about the best left-handed pitcher he faced? Yeah. Yeah. He, and he said Newhauser should have been in the hall of fame. And in the, um, uh, couple fellows wrote a book in 1986 in which they asked big leaguers from many eras to pick from their eras a 10-man team, eight position players and a right and left-handed pitcher that they would have for one crucial game. And for those who uh, were in the era when Newhauser pitched, 13 of those players named him as their choice for the left-handed pitcher. That was more than anybody else in that era. You know, and yet until next, the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. The next year after that, 22 of them picked Whitey Ford and, uh, and 18 picked Lefty Grove for the era before. But for those in the era when Neuhauser was pitching, they picked him as the best left-hander. And yet, until you wrote that book, he just wasn't recognized as the pitcher he should have been recognized for. The guy was a great pitcher, war or no war. That's right, he was. And, uh, you know, there were other books that came out doing some of the, you know, newer statistical stuff, but they ranked Hal Neuhauser as the eighth best left handed pitcher of all time. That's certainly Hall of Fame worthy. And, of course, 
he could only beat and play against the competition that was on the field. Sort of like when we talk about college football today, you could only play and beat the teams that are on your schedule. So you can't compare it. Well, you know, they didn't play them or they didn't play them. They beat the teams that they have to beat that are on the schedule. And that's what Hal Newhauser did. He could only play against the teams that were on the schedule and the players that those teams fielded. And at that time period, he was the best. That's right. He was, you know, the, uh, when the, the eighth best left-handed pitcher, he was, that was behind Koufax, Grove, uh, Warren Spahn, Steve Carlton, Carl Hubble, Whitey Ford and Lefty Gomez, but none of them were in his era. They were all before or after him. And uh, nobody else in his time was anywhere close to that. That's awesome. Hey, tell me about how fiery a guy he was, especially early on. He had, as you had said earlier, somewhat of a temper. Tell me about that. Well, he... He reacted badly to things that went wrong. If, uh, if umpires called pitches balls that he thought were strikes or if somebody uh, made an error behind him, he frequently lost his temper about that. And, uh, you know, was, he was a, a teenager <laughs> at that point. He was just learning how to go about pitching professionally and, uh, he now, needed somebody to sit him down and calm him down, and that's what happened with Paul Richards. Yeah, I was going to ask you how much of that had to do with his age. I think a great deal had to do with his age. Tell me about his battles with Bob Feller. They they, <laughs> they, they matched up a, a, quite a few times, and I guess that would have been the other great pitcher of the time, even though he did serve in the war. Tell me about his battles with Bob. Yeah, they had quite a few games where they pitched against one another. And uh, <laughs> one season, I remember, uh, they were opening the season against Cleveland. And uh, because Hal was the ace of the Detroit staff, he pitched the first game. And <laughs> the Cleveland front office was upset with the Tigers because – they didn't wait and pitch him against Feller in the second game. <laughs> Steve O'Neill, the Tigers manager, said, we had our rotation. It was his turn to pitch, so he pitched. <laughs> and <laughs> they, Because when Newhouser and Feller matched up against each other in a game, they usually had a huge crowd turnout. Right. Were there any because, hitters? Were there any hitters we might know like a Ted Williams, a Mickey Mantle, uh, uh, common name hitters who had a particularly tough time facing Hal Newhouser. Well, <laughs> Lou Boudreau said Newhouser was one of the toughest pitchers for him. He said, I could never follow his pitches. A number of players, you know, I have a list of them here in the book <laughs> Al Rosen, Ray Boone, George Case, Ned Garver. George Kell, Ted Lyons, Johnny Pesky, Ted Williams, who all stated that Newhouser should be in the Hall of Fame. And uh, Hank Greenberg, I, I talked to Hank Greenberg about it over the telephone. <laughs> he said, I definitely feel that he should be in the Hall of Fame. And that was when he wasn't. So you know, now he is, and I'm very happy Whenever I get up to Cooperstown, I can go up and stand for a couple minutes and gaze up at this plaque on the wall with Hal Newhouser's picture on it. And he thanked you for that. Tell me about the letter. Yeah, right after he got elected, he sent me a letter, and he said he wanted to thank me for the my involvement in the Harold Newhouser's life, and uh, both in writing the book and in the campaign to get him into the Hall of Fame. And uh, he was very, very grateful for that. And I was very pleased to have been able to help him like that. 
David, thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. Hey, anything you're working on right now that you'd like to tell us about? <laughs> I'm trying to get another book published. <laughs> <laughs> well, a biography of Robert A. Lovett, who has not been very well known. He helped to uh, build up the Army Air Force during World War II, and then he later was under Secretary of State to Marshall for the Marshall Plan and NATO and the Berlin Airlift and Secretary of Defense under Truman. But uh, nobody's ever written a biography of him until now. And where can so, people... Where, where can people, However, I'm, ha- go, I'm go having trouble getting the university presses to look into it. <laughs> where can people find so, more of your work? Well... All of my books are available on Amazon.com. And there's some great ones in there. I love your stuff about the A's as well. David, thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. You've been a terrific guest. Thank you, Warren. I've been very pleased to be able to participate. As David said, his work is available on Amazon.com. The A's of baseball history. Occasional Glory, the History of the Philadelphia Phillies, and biographies on such soldiers as Winfield Scott Hancock and General G.K. Warren. If you visit sportsfh.com, you can see the letter that Hal wrote to David thanking him for his help in getting Hal elected. You know, there are so many players in baseball who have fallen just short of election for one reason or another. Gil Hodges, Louis Tion, Dale Murphy, Ken Boyer, Bill Dolan, and Jim Cott, to name just a few. And had it not been for Jordan, perhaps, Hal Neuhauser, the only pitcher in baseball history to win back-to-back MVP awards, might never have made it to Cooperstown. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we'll take a look back at the man who revolutionized the game of football with his play at quarterback, The man who turned the game of football from a running game into one in which you could strike quickly from the air. Hall of Famer, Benny Freed. Thanks again to today's guest, David M. Jordan, and we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.